Um, well, yeah, I'll just get right in. Um, you know, the purpose of this call and some other calls that I hope to do in the future is really to just sort of, you know, get as big a picture as you'd like to share about your experience being a black student at Belmont. So just take it away and I'll have some follow up questions for you. All right. Well, uh, thank you for um, honestly, you know, using your platform. Oh, I think this is great. Um, this is what we need as students. And all, honestly, just what we need in general is to listen. Um, that's one of the biggest things I've learned as a communication major, you know, it's, it's that being able to speak effectively, cause you know, some people really will throw anything, you know, throw accusations, but no solutions. And so, um, once we become solution focused and purpose driven, that's when we can implement change. Um, and so I love what you're doing. Um, but my name is Christian, um, Christian Vickers. I'm a senior at Belmont. Um, major in corporate communications uh, with a minor in marketing and graphic design. Um, and so my, I came into Belmont fall 17. It feels so long ago, <laughs> but um, it's definitely been a journey. Um, I started off on the track team at Belmont, graduated from Hunters Lane, um, and then I started running track and stuff like that. Um, and so I was just a student athlete um and just going straight to class going straight to practice i really wasn't engaged in student organizations and stuff like that so it was different um i just was always around the athletics and so um even then um that's a whole nother topic of you know diversity in itself in a nutshell but um i just i i endured a lot um there was devs in college that i, I experienced that were like close people um and and honestly the the support group i had of the, the black students was really strong you know we're always there for each other but it just would feel so much better if everyone was there playing their part and helping each other as a community um which is very different and so um i quit the track team i had ran into some racial incidents um going into my spring semester of my sophomore year um and probably hear about that story later but um for this purpose I'm gonna keep it educational <laughs> um but um and it led me to to write that paper um the eight ball um because I was going through a lot um with frustration with the athletic department how they handled situations and um and just hearing so many stories at Belmont on how they play hush with with some instances you know having people pushing people to leave and and um just how they handle stuff i don't think it's more of like they won't change until it's in their face and then people are mad and then that's when like oh okay maybe we should look at this um and so i wrote that paper um talking about the difference in nonverbals, talking about dialectic tensions and just a race but also just the experience and so um, I had so many occasions where I was looked at on campus where people would not even recognize me. I would smile and they would just, or the, the famous look at my phone while I walk by. And I'm like, I played myself. <laughs> like I was just trying to say hello or just smile. And, and it just became so consistent that it just would keep happening. And, and even in class, you know, professors were talking about culture and, and, you know, he's talking about country and I'm like, okay, well, country is just a genre of music. But then he starts talking about hip hop and, oh, hip hop is, 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 is God is the devil's music. And, you know, like, it's so terrible. And I'm like, that's a part of my culture it's one of the smallest part, but it's, it's so much more to it than just music. It, it paints a history. It's how people told their stories about not only police brutality, but just the hardships of black men and women and families. And that was the only way to get attention or a platform to get attention is by music. But just as we see now, it's became a problem because people take it as a hashtag as a trend. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love, I love hip hop. I love the music. Well, why can't I say this word? You know, everybody should be able to say it. And I'm like, 
no, you don't have the right to say that. And so um, it's just this constant battle, like internally um, that I've been experiencing at Belmont. And so that's why I just honestly was like this. I had to take this opportunity and speak up. Yeah. So I just thank you. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate your, your willingness to speak. Um, yeah. yeah. So I read back through your essay and, um, you know, picked out some things that I wanted to follow up on, dive deeper into. Mm-hmm. One of the things you led off with was something to the effect of <clears throat> you felt like you've lived a privileged life, uh, despite, yeah. you know, racial tensions and things like that. Uh, so I was going to ask what aspects of Belmont have made you feel disadvantaged? Which aspects have made you feel privileged? Have you felt somewhere in between? Yeah. Um, I definitely felt a disconnect um, just because um, at the time when I came in, I was already looked at as a student athlete before I even spoke. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was what really made me mad because I'm like, just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm a student athlete. Like, just because I'm black doesn't mean I play basketball. (laughs) Like, I'm 5'8", and I'm very sure. Like, (laughs) anybody could tell you, do not put Christian on the court. (laughs) Like, like, he's the fast break guy. He can get down the court quick and just have, like, just – Christian, pass the ball. (laughs) Just all pass it. Like, don't shoot. Don't try to get the re. Just, just like I feel the role. Like, (laughs) so basketball was not me. Like, yeah. So, but it just was irritating because you know it just was this accusation or people assumed, and and so um, that was one aspect. And and honestly, there's there's these gaps between what we ex- as students experience than what administration actually know. And I think that's where I was more amazed at the disconnect because as students, we don't see what you know our professors go through and then you don't see what the dean of students go through and the, the dean and the associate dean. And so it's almost like that ladder. And so because there is no actual structure in terms of like, who to contact specifically people just go to whoever they look like and then just communicate with them. And so um, I would definitely think it would be important to know who to reach out to. Um, And so that's the problem. There wasn't too many faculty that looked like me that would understand exactly how to address and how to move forward. Not saying that there's none of them at all, but it's the presence isn't there. And so it was so hard not to type that into the paper about faculty because I wanted to, I wanted to go there, but I was like, Oh no, I just need to stay on point. Um, And uh, also just my friends um, or associates now um, it's been a long time coming from freshman year, but um, they just couldn't grasp what I was going through. Like, I, I never forget one story um, where I had told I had I told one of my friends at the time where um, I had got pulled over in high school. I was driving this car and I had a dealership tag and I was going to get a license plate the next day. I got pulled over and the cop cop um, the cop was like, "Let me see your license and registration." Now I had somebody in the car, so I'm like thankful for that. But as we can see, it doesn't matter too, um, and so. I got everything, handed them anything. I had no, like, my record is clean. I've never got pulled over for anything. And so um, they let me drive off. I could, I didn't even drive not even five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. I got down the street, and excuse me, so I turned, and I I saw the cop car um, behind me, and I was like, okay, I'm at a stop sign. Let me, one two, three, let me drive. (laughs) So I waited and I drove and then the blue lights came on and I was like, I just got pulled over. And so then when the cop car, the cop came to the window, he was like, do you know why I pulled you over? And I'm like, no officer, why did I get pulled over? And so he was like, you know, you don't have a deal. You have a dealership tag. And I was like, sir, I just was pulled over. Not even that long ago. And he said, oh, by this guy. So at that time, the same guy that pulled me over pulls up behind him, gets out. And then was like, he was like, did you just pull this guy over? He's like, yeah, I just did. And so then he was like, well, I guess that just shows you how important it is to have a license, a license tag. 
And I'm like, I'm boiling <laughs> because I'm like, and when I told her that, she was like, oh, well, that's just a coincidence. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not a coincidence yeah, right. that I literally got pulled over by the same guy at night driving a car with no actual dealers, no, just a dealership tag. Come on. Yeah. Like, they were just harassing me. You know, I got to say, not to make it about me or anything, but I've been pulled over once in my life and it was for that exact same reason. It was, you know, I had my the first month that I had my car and I still had the dealership plates. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I did not get pulled over twice in the span of half an hour or whatever it was. Right. Not racially profiled. So, I mean, that's just textbook examples of white right. privilege. <laughs> of right. Why people who look like me don't have to and just generally don't worry about you know, the consequences of getting pulled over beyond just having right. to the officer in the, through the window. Right. And I think also, too, um, the scariest thing, and I, and I actually put that um, in my project for my psychology project, I did an implicit racial bias. And um, I talked about, you know, as a black, as a black man, my parents talk, the talk, not about sex, but the talk about how to act around police. That's something that every black person has to have and it shouldn't be. I might like my mom always is terrified of me leaving the house because she doesn't know. That sh it shouldn't be like that. Like my mom was that close to buying some little plastic sleeve so I can keep my insurance and my driver's license on the dash so that I don't get shot because I'm trying to reach for some weapon. That's ridiculous. It, it shouldn't be like that, but this is this is a society that we live in and we've been thriving in, and it and it shouldn't be like that. Yeah, I'm mean, gonna go back to one thing you said um, about you know going to someone at Belmont to talk about a problem. It's interesting to bring that up because I've you know when I've talked to faculty members that I'm close with about similar things, something I hear a lot is you know the struggle of having to support the student um, because of whatever situation they're in versus following the regulations about reporting to someone higher up on that ladder you talked about. Um, so have you ever had anything, you know, where you felt like I want to tell someone about this, but I'm worried that if I do, it'll make its way to someone that I don't want to know about it. Um, no, I'll actually say on, on that, maybe they did so well on being confident like confident about it like maybe uh actually no i'll say that i actually never had a situation where i've told somebody in administration mm -hmm. and in some way it trickled down yeah um, i think that they do a good job honestly on that in keeping everything confidential like everything that you report to them it's in a file and it doesn't get and it's not shared I, I will say they do a good job on that when i've had multiple conversations with you know people like that so mm -hmm. yeah so um further on that point of just you know people supporting each other in a university setting and one of the sort of the main points of of uh your the, the piece of writing you had was about the types of tension that you've mm -hmm. experienced and one of them was the blackness whiteness tension Right. So my question is, how can college age students understand the best way to unite while still, you know, recognizing and acknowledging differences? So the, the whole point about not being colorblind, but color aware, things like that. Right. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, when I was talking about the blackness and whiteness, um, that was really honing on that point about where I came from, um, going back on being privileged. I grew up in the suburbs. I didn't grow up in the projects. Now, my, some of my friends that I went to high school with, they grew up in lower income communities mm -hmm. and I could, I could understand, I could see it visually. And so when, once I still hang out with some of them, they're like, oh, you're at the, you at Belmont, you're at Belmont and you're bougie and you got chandeliers <laughs> and all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I just go there for education. <laughs> like, yes, you know, we all, they, they have so much money and all that, but that's not me. They still haven't changed who I am. And so um, I think 
knowing that dialectic tension in terms of knowing uh, that, oh, what is it? What did I say? Uh, what is it? Uh, the immediacy. There you go. Yeah. So when I was talking about that, I think it wasn't in terms of like a outward perspective on like, this guy is black, this guy is white, and how do I communicate? I think it was more of an internal feeling of one who is black and then comparing it from a blackness of whiteness to tone that to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so to answer your question, I honestly think for somebody to become aware first has to ask questions. Um, they have to be able to take themselves out of their shoes and be willing to listen one, but two, empathize. Mm -hmm. I think once people can be able to say, like you said, like, wow, I got pulled over, but I, or I never got pulled over and I had a dealership tag for a month. Mm -hmm. So if I told you my story, that being able to say, I hear you, I understand, and adding to the conversation, I think that's where people start seeing change because they start understanding the context behind the content and then they start changing their looks in terms of how they communicate to people that don't look like them. Mm -hmm. um, and so where do you start? Honestly, it, it starts with contacting. Now, of course, not saying go contact every person that doesn't look like you and tell me how you feel. <laughs> like, of course, <laughs> there's some privacy behind it. Mm -hmm. But it's as simple as starting a conversation. Um, one of my good roommates had actually reached out to me and he's talking about how he took a Native American class and he saw how terrible the Native Americans were treated. And so it made, it made the connection of what's going on now. And now we have communication on what does defunding the police look like? Mm -hmm. what, does, what do they mean when they say, you know, uh, racial profiling and in the context of what you've experienced, what does it, so like people I've learned in terms of being at Belmont, honestly, uh, not to, to sound like, oh, white people are all bad. I've learned that there's three types of people. There's people that are progressive, that are always looking to ask questions. There's people, number two, there's people that are they they see it they don't know how to address it so like they're stuck mm -hmm. and then there's people that choose to not they close their eyes right and they choose to be ignorant mm -hmm. and i think when you have a conversation with those people that are two those people that are two are able to pull those people that are threes mm -hmm. and it may be too hard for those people that are ones to pull somebody that's a three yeah. And so you have to be able to shift their mindset. Mm -hmm. And so once you, you, you get them to be excited or eager to learn, that's when people change. You can throw the textbook at anybody and they still won't pick it up. They have to find that within themselves. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's my, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's absolutely. And I mean, okay. for me, just in the last few weeks, as I've been making an effort to sort of do my part in, in learning, Mm -hmm. you know just listening to let's say the 1619 podcast from the new york times mm -hmm. like there's just something inherently interesting about black history and that's when you when you pay attention to to that kind of thing it will like you say just cultivate an interest in, in wanting to learn more and then wanting to do more so i mm -hmm. think you know people who are looking for ways to get involved just learn learn to love to learn if that makes mm -hmm. sense Agree? yeah no that's it that's it when you start adding value to people's lives they change mm -hmm. and i think honestly um when i wrote that paper looking back on it i just laugh because i'm like you never know what kind of impact you have on somebody's life reading that paper mm -hmm. um and so um i think that's what my journey is 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 honestly adding significance to others not based off my success my success is just me as an individual, but significance is the impact that I put in somebody else that takes that same energy and puts into somebody else. And so then it's a ripple effect. Yeah. And so um, 
that's my focus now at Belmont, even in my last year, going into my last year, Mm -hmm. I'm like, how can I help somebody that's behind me that's coming? Yeah. How can I spark that fire in somebody else to be like, I want to do everything I need to do to get better as an individual, but more aware. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sort of following up on that in your experience, um, where have your peers been successful in speaking up against and dismantling racism and where have they fallen short? Um, I think, I think uh, starting with the negative first, um, I think where, and you talking about the black community at Belmont or just in general? Your Belmont peers, black or white. Okay. Yeah, so I feel like, I could go all day. Um, I feel like where they fall in, um, honestly, in the black community at Belmont, I think there's a lot of confusion on who to reach out, like following those chains. You understand there's a ladder and you don't skip a step. One, two, I feel like there's, like I said, a lot of throwing stuff on the wall and there's no solutions. If you have a problem with something, you can't go to somebody that can be able, possibly to be able to fix it and say, I have a problem. I hate this. I hate that. Like, this doesn't make sense that you do this. And they're going to hit you with that question of why. And, um, well, how does it look like that? Well, how can we fix it? And then you just say, well, I don't like it. <laughs> That's not solving anything. And so I, I've seen from my years, freshman to now, um, there's starting to be a shift in terms of leadership, in terms of um, that vision. But honestly, it's the same underlying battle that's been here since who knows how long is that that covert like that sub subliminal messages those actions that that culture that's built like that's the problem that we have as the black community that when you look at at faculty when you look at even like even talking about that like it hurts me as a black man to be on campus And the only black people that I honestly see working are the people that work in the CAF, the people that that work uh, campus security, the people that work, like why am I not seeing those people in leadership? Why am I not seeing the Dean of Students? Or why am I not seeing, you know, department chair? Like I I would love to see that that diversity in in not only our students, but also in faculty, not just, like, cause then it just looks like the help. Like you got all the minorities working these landscaping, these food, the, the cooking, the cooks. Like it, it makes me sick when I see people like that. Not to say, oh, make all the white people do the landscape. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's, it's just when I see it, it, it kind of, you know, it's like that burden. Um, and, and that's, I think that's where the problem is, is that it's, it's no solution, ta- like f- there's no solution in it mm-hmm. um, that people are able to communicate effectively on a, a, like a bullet point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's been my journey, honestly, that I'm, I actually worked on something. I can't like tell you yet, but I'm already working on a whole training curriculum on hopefully that might be able to go in effect to see if it works. Yeah. Um, I will say the positive things. Oh, also and the third thing that's negative is those that you make aware and they choose to do nothing. Those ones that are silent, those ones that say it's a coincidence, those ones that think, well, it doesn't affect me. So I don't know those types of people, or they, they put on a face that they care about you and they really don't. Like those are the ones that's like that that kind of push people over the edge because you don't you you say you think you understand and you don't you're not trying to understand you're not listening um, but the positive notes I will say is that honestly um, there's those that have a good heart that those that really do care um, I I never. 
I would never say Bob Fisher doesn't care about his his minority community. Yeah. Does he know how to like effectively address it? No, because he's probably never been in a predicament. So who is he to go to? Especially when your your leadership isn't as diverse to be able to handle like there there's strong women in in leadership like Dr. Sternberg. And if she watches this, I know she's going to be happy because I will be so quick to call her Dr. Archie. <laughs> and she's like, I'm stern, bro. <laughs> so I got it right. I got it right. But there's so many women that are, that are strong that are leading, like my mother, Dr. West, Dr. Clark. Like, there's presence. But when they come to those crisis communications, when they make those decisions, I'm like, there's no way somebody didn't proof check this to be like, okay, this is a good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like, that's what bothers me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, there, there are some positives. I just can't think off the top of my head. Um, honestly, I think like bold, bold was a great addition. Yes. That's really, that's really putting those, those stereotypes and those stigmas on its head everybody can be a leader if you have a heartbeat you can be a leader yeah like i love it like dr sternberg was a genius for creating bold because she took a stigma and made it something yeah made something beautiful out of it when you look at bridges to belmont belmont was pretty pretty white it was pretty bad it was pretty bad with minorities they took that bird and that stigma and they added a whole nother department of minority and culture like multicultural like they they were able to bring black students onto campus in lower income communities providing that opportunity so like there's some things that to highlight you know diversity council like there's there's things that belmont has done positive um but we all know when we look at the negative that's what we want to point out first um so that's what i want to say and address too yeah yeah, Bold was one of the highlights of my freshman year. I did several yeah. of them. Dr. Sternberg, I mean, she's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, high energy. So high. Energy. I'm like, you don't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she is the, the definition of charismatic. Yes. She can yes. She can lead anyone. <laughs> yes, I, and I love her her energy, her charisma. Like, Absolutely. it's it's contagious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so what kind of black led campaigns or events, whether it's with black student association or convocation credits, what kind of things like that are sort of happening under people's noses, especially under white students noses that they just don't know about and don't know how to get engaged? Um, I think, honestly, I'll shout out, uh, Dr. HH and Shelby Longer. Those two, they, they actually did a whole um women's movement in terms of like convo and stuff like that and so i think it honestly it just takes people communicating um i know i'm not perfect i don't even go to some of the bsa (laughs) things i'm like this assignment due at midnight i might have to sit this one out so um it and honestly it goes right back to what I said before. It it starts with people being wanting to to learn. I think you could look at a whole list of convos and you're gonna easily be like, this looks interesting, I'm gonna go. And and it's hard to try and get people to come to an event that if they don't feel like it's in their hearts to go, they're gonna choose not to go. They're gonna try and see what else can I go around to fill this requirement instead of, you know, this doesn't look, eh. Um, So it's hard. It's, it's hard trying to fill that gap, especially when you're the minority. Yeah. On a touchy uh, topic. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of, it's kind of difficult. And even then, like, how are you supposed to educate somebody in 50 minutes? It's, it's not going to make an impact. Mm-hmm. They're just going to be like, I heard them talk. 
I heard them talk about things that I've heard before in social studies in high school, but I I got credit. Yeah. And and that's probably what's gonna happen every single time. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to what we talked about earlier about sort of instilling a love of learning is that how much of that can you really accomplish in an hour? Right. How do you best utilize a 50 minute block to create a pattern where people will want to come back and want to want to learn more? All right. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from your essay that uh, where you, you cited a research study. Mm -hmm. So you said the researchers found significant social differences between the African-American and Caucasian students. African-American students preferred their instructors to demonstrate high nonverbal immediacy behaviors such as welcoming proximity, smiling and eye contact. However, white students preferred professors who were less nonverbally immediate and more verbally immediate, which includes verbal feedback, small talk or directly addressing students by name. Immediacy is just one of the many differences in norms between the two cultures at a university. Understanding that black and white students have opposing expectations of nonverbal and verbal classroom norms can help teachers bridge the gap and make all their students feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So in your personal experience, does this hold true? And how can instructors at Belmont do better to support the varying needs of students of all races and cultures? That's a good question. Um, yes, it, it honestly, it, that's how honestly black people communicate that's how we vibe that's how like every person that i've honestly met it's that's that's the culture when i go to hbcus it's always welcoming it's always now i will say they will make fun of you <laughs> because you go to a pwi or you come off as bougie and you're like oh you're one of those <laughs> yeah like they they will make fun of you but it's always welcoming yeah um and so you know i i think we always as black people too we always look at people like okay you you talk a good game but where's your heart and i think that goes right back into like what i talked about like those the like we really thrive off energy and if your energy is there and and you're teaching and and when you're like like a lot of my communication professors they're high energy and they do well my accounting professor awful some of my business courses was like the ones that i did good in they were energetic they were passionate they were like they they had more of those high immediacy and so um when i would look at it i was like wow this data actually reflects who i am and so i started asking friends that look like me i'm like do you think this is true does this hold weight and they're like that's me too and i'm like okay that's crazy and so um i think how to fill that gap honestly it takes their level of commitment to the student. A teacher is there to serve the student. A student is there to serve the teacher and learn the things that they're teaching. And so it's, it's a two-way street. Um, the student has to be able first to address how they feel or what things are as simple as disability. When they say, hey, hand me the slip that, that proves that you have some form of disability, ADHD, blah, 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 all that good stuff, it's the same way you should be able to reach out to your professor and be like, hey, you know, um, not saying your teaching style sucks, but <laughs> like, I'm not able to, you know, I'm not able to retain the material that you teach. Like, I just didn't get that well. Do you think you could go over it again? Or do you think, you know, you could change this, that might be better. I've talked to a couple of other students and they agree with me, because now that's gonna, brings that's gonna ring a bell they're like hmm, okay maybe i'm not teaching well for this class it's just as as a reflection of if this course of this class is doing way better than the other course they're gonna be like okay what the heck did i do different it's the same course it's just a different time what did i do different and so um that's why i say it's a two-way street because the teacher has to be able to look to say okay you don't look engaged into the class or they don't look as excited because it's at 8 a.m and this is a 1 a.m or 1 p.m so like of course <laughs> the engagement level is going to be very different <laughs> but 
on a on a tension on a, a dialectic tension level or a, a channel of communication it it also depends on the teacher i had um a accounting professor because i failed the accounting class i had to take it over the summer thank you jesus for letting me pass that <laughs> but i promise you he was one of the most monotone, boring guys I've ever met. Dry, like dry sense of humor. Like he would probably love the office. I promise you. <laughs> like I, I can't make this up. But he was practical in terms of step by step of teaching me, and that worked. Yeah. So, like, not to say every teacher has to be energetic. They have to know what works for the student mm -hmm. to be able to teach them effectively. Yeah. Um, so that's why I say it's a two way street. Yeah. But first, you have to communicate for yeah. people to know. <laughs> so, yeah. Teachers have to be adaptive, basically. Yes. It's yes. on the teacher to, to look for the best ways to adapt to their students so the students just don't get lost. Right. I mean, even doing a survey in the beginning and the end, what, yeah. do you, what would you love to see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Even in the halfway mark, okay, what, what don't you like? I'm not, I'm sure as much, Lord knows, as much documents they type up for assignments, I'm very sure they can create some 10 question yeah. <laughs> assessment. Mm -hmm. And that's <laughs> not from Dr. Burns, like. <laughs> right. And that type of thing where you, you fill out a survey goes back to what you were talking about, where, you know, one of these principles that, that you follow is to serve the people behind you. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when the semester's done, you can't go back and, and redo the way things were, but there's mm -hmm. something to be said for filling out a survey so the people who come after you can have a better experience. Right. Yeah. They, you, I think one of the biggest things I learned, honestly, is, is I, I had to change my perspective. Um, when I first got to Belmont, I always felt like I was on defense. Everybody was attacking me. Mm -hmm. I felt like, well, why'd you say it that way? Like, I only, like, my mom always said, you know, whatever lens you choose to see through, that's what you'll see. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, honestly, when you start looking through that lens, that's where it becomes dangerous because then you start attacking the professor and they didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think the environment, you have to make the environment open enough for them to communicate. And if you're just that professor that just shows up to come in and, and leave and teach and get a check, you're not going to have, you're not going to make that impact. And I think also that leads into the next thing. There has to be a level of accountability. Mm -hmm. if, a, if five, if 10, 15 students say this teacher suck, why is he still teaching? <laughs> <laughs> like y'all say y'all check these, you know, evaluations and these reports and stuff. And I'm like, this guy really didn't teach me anything. And I spent $400 on this book and I spent, you know, $3,000 on this class. And what do I have to show for it? I, he just didn't make an environment safe enough to be able to communicate. So I think that's what professors have to do. If they're watching this, they have to be able to make the environment open enough to where people want to come to them to talk and express. Like, I loved a lot of my communication professors because they did that. Of course, every professor has an open door policy, but if you're not doing that in the classroom, they're just going to show up to you, be like, hey, I didn't get this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and you're not getting right at the root. Yeah. Um, so there's another quote from your, from your writing that I wanted to, mm -hmm. to give back to you. Uh, one of the last things you wrote was, the battle is, do I really express myself to others in my classroom, knowing that I may be viewed in a negative way, or do I take a leap of faith and hopefully make an impact? Mm -hmm. So in the months since you've written this, do you feel that you found an answer to this question or come close to finding the answer to this question? Yeah, um, I think that, and as me typing it, I think I kind of laugh because I'm like, I'm doing it. <laughs> look looking at it back now like it's been a couple of years mm -hmm. i'm laughing because i'm like you did it you're you're literally you're not even doing it anymore you're living it it's become a lifestyle like my decisions that i choose to make to, to hopefully cause that impact that ripple effect i'm living it out like this talk right now i'm living out that leap of faith that mm -hmm. even if 
it falls on deaf ears. I spoke, I did my job, I played my role. And, and honestly, I would feel better about myself than remaining silent. And we see now today how dangerous it is to remain silent because if you if you're able to communicate and and talk to others that want to hear you would have never known if you remain silent if i didn't send you you know my article you would never know you would have never found that article absolutely <laughs> so i think honestly it it takes that level of breathe and just just go for it because at the at the end of the day if you did your best it's going to show it's going to come back in some shape or form whether you know it or not if even if it's 10 years from now as you can see i wrote this paper and 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 these last month and a half i've gotten calls and texts from people saying this paper that you wrote is is crazy this is what belmont is fighting now and i'm like I wrote that as a sophomore. I can't even tell you like where I, I like, I could tell you like, oh, can, this is where I kind of was, but like, I can't, you know, nonverbals. I'm like, oh, it's been a minute. Hold on. <laughs> let, let me look up the definition real quick. <laughs> so it's, it's just like, I feel, I feel really good about myself because this is kind of just confirmation that I'm making that small impact mm -hmm. um, and that, for anybody listening to this, regardless of your race or color, you have a voice and it matters. And if you have a story, tell it. People love stories. Like Nike does the best job. I'm a big fan of Nike, but Nike always paints a story. They, that, and that's how they impact others. Um, and so if you tell it, people are gonna listen regardless. Is there anything else that you want people to know about your experience at Belmont, about anything race related or just about you personally? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I really would love to, for people to take for a takeaway is be careful of the voices that you hear in your head and also the people that, that surround you. Um, I honestly was misled by some people on my circle. Um, there was things that didn't get done because I chose to listen to those people. And also you have to know in yourself that it's not about yourself, it's about others. When you can honestly start with your why, when you can start with your why, how and what comes easy. And so when you become solution focused and, and purpose driven, you really, the negativity really doesn't hit you. Like it's just a, okay, that's just, that's just not another thing. And, and so um, when I would look, when I would be on campus, I changed my focus from people seeing them as them attacking me or people as, oh, they're just that person. They're just that Belmont person that always portrays that they care about people and they don't. I became, I began to, change my focus on that instead of being like so what they don't look at me i'm gonna smile and say hello because i don't know what you're going through yeah i'm gonna instead of you know acting like oh everybody's holding the door getting in the jack i'm gonna just act like i'm gonna just slide in that door let me hold the door for someone you know oh i see this person run into the elevator the jack we know it takes 10 minutes for the for it to hit the first <laughs> floor i'm gonna hold the door <laughs> and wait for them so they have to take the steps so it's just those small random acts of kindness yeah. that starts to ripple effect across across the campus yeah. and and so when you change your heart you can change many others minds and their hearts and and you have to be welcoming and loving um not to just people that look like you but even if you go to the cafe and sit with somebody that does not look like you or you don't even know them, if you, if you walk up to somebody and be like, hey, you know, can I sit with you? They, they're not going to be like, ew. <laughs> you know, like, like, we're adults. <laughs> this is not high school. <laughs> so, like, 
just just do something you've never done before honestly yeah um so i i think i talked a lot i'm a talker but that's that's just who i am i think the biggest thing i will say for any incoming freshman Mm -hmm. coming in is i'm gonna do this for every class and then we're gonna call it a wrap for freshmen come in strong and and remember how you feel your passion remember that because that fire is going to get you through every single battle every single l lord knows how many l's i've taken (laughs) so remember that remember why you chose belmont remember why you know you're you're in that dorm you're in why you chose that community why you chose to be in that student organization write those down and and when you write those down write your goals as a freshman what do you think you need to be doing not just what class i need to take to make sure i graduate but what kind of goals and impact do i want to leave at belmont and put a date yeah when you can put a date on any dream the percentage of you accomplishing that dream is going to be way better. And so, you know, that's what you have to do as a freshman. Talk to everyone because you never know what kind of impact you're going to have or not even an impact, honestly, because it's just freshman year, but what kind of relationships you build. And so when you build that network, that's what college is for, building networks. You, you You begin to have those connections with people that you never thought you would have connections with. Going into your sophomore year, you learned what L's and what the, the norms and what, you know, things you should and should not do your freshman year and mistakes. Um, you take that, you analyze it, and you rebuttal, and then you learn and go move forward. And so um, my, my biggest thing, my, my takeaway for sophomores is, is honestly – Laugh at your freshman year. (laughs) Laugh at your freshman year and think, what do you need to do? Because you're right at the halfway mark. You're you're like, okay, I finished all my gen eds. (laughs) Like now I'm starting to get into my major stuff. Am I sitting in the right position to go where I want to go in careers and life and and relationships? Like sophomore year is is the pivotal point like where things start going left right in the like that's an important part the most important time your junior year honestly keep the work going don't stop the work the the takeaway for that is literally that don't stop keep going put the best foot forward and remember why you started when you can look back and be like, geez, two years have gone by. Yeah. Remember all those L's that you took. I, I'm gonna go to senior year, senior year, junior year, remember those and really say the trajectory where I'm at, is this where I want to go? You Now you're like, okay, I graduate next year or I, I got one more year. That's when you need to start checking like what, what goals have I met? What impact have I started to build for myself going into my senior year okay what are the things I haven't done that I said I wanted to do for myself and honestly am I the person that I want to be and I think when you can start seeing that you became who you became on accident and change who you you who you became on accident and choose to be who you want to become that's when you start seeing value being like there. That's when you start changing. And so going into the senior year, start off with the same way. Remember the L's. <laughs> Remember those all-nighters. Remember all of those good laughs, those memories that you built, the people that are here at Belmont still, the people that aren't here at Belmont anymore or at college or whatever. Remember those people and just be thankful that you're still here strong alive doing well of course you got maybe some c's and d's sprinkled or you just got all a's and you're great kumbaya that's great for you not everybody's (laughs) like that so like you know remember those 
because those are just as important as why you started. And I think when I'm going into my senior year now, like I just laugh and like, wow, you know, look who I've became, look who like where I've started. And, and honestly, when you start looking at, I'm a senior now and I see these freshmen coming in, that's your drive because now you're like, okay, how can I help them? And so take away for your senior year, it needs to be, first of all, am I on track to graduate? <laughs> That's the priority. Because if you if you thinking you graduate in the spring and you graduate in August, come on, we got a problem. Like, you didn't. You obviously wasn't doing the takeaways from three years before, like I said. <laughs> so, senior year, you need to be looking. What have I done? How can I help? And honestly just embrace those those moments um and and then you graduate and when you graduate it's it's probably the best feeling i'm pretty sure 2020 didn't experience that but for everyone else hopefully COVID is gone hopefully all of this blows over everybody keeps saying hopefully and then it keeps adding time but (laughs) like when you make it great but that's just the start of your life People get so caught up on this one part of life of graduating and they don't think, I don't have a job lined up. Where am I going to live? (laughs) Like I'm living on campus, but where am I going to live? Do I have, you know, uh, savings? Do I have like life hits? When you cross that stage and shake that hand and you sit, throw the cap, take pictures and leave that door, life hits you and it does not care people i've seen so many people graduate and now they work in hr but they majored in criminology (laughs) or there's so many people that that are doing the things that they went to school for and they're not doing it because they didn't have a well thought out plan to execute it and so honestly that's that's my that was a good one for senior year. I need to have, actually take notes on myself and try to see, if, okay, am I preaching what I'm saying I was doing? Okay, let me, let me see if I'm doing that. Uh, so that's everybody. I, I try to hit everyone. Faculty, um, takeaway is love your coworker. Show love to them because you don't know what they're going through. And, and honestly, um, it's just having those conversations with somebody in financial financial aid or somebody in, in, I don't know, (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Like we're all connected because we are a part of one organization. We are a part of Belmont and whatever culture, whatever, it should not matter what department you're in. If you're a landscaper and you're Bob Fisher, you're both a part of Belmont. Bob Fisher does not own Belmont. Belmont is Belmont, (laughs) Bell money, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) It is Belmont. He is just a representative and he is just the face. And so when we understand that people just love being around people regardless and just love talking and sharing and harmonizing as one, that's when we'll start seeing that. And it starts with the student, but it really is guided by faculty and the leadership. Leadership lead, (laughs) leadership fails so that they can lead better. That's the whole, that's the cycle. And that's the cycle we're in right now is that leadership failed (laughs) multiple times, generation to generation. They weren't doing the things that they should have been doing, that they could have been doing, and we see it. And so um, honestly, that's, that's my I I literally hit everyone even if you're a landscaper you better cut that lawn so good for Miss Fisher because she's gonna be out there (laughs) shaking I have jokes all day I play too much I can do that though because I'm about to graduate I'm I'm a senior so I can do that so um, that's where everybody's tuition goes anyways shade but I'm gonna leave that alone So it's all good, though. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for your time and for that amazing advice to literally everybody, like you said. Yeah. I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah.
forward to, to getting this out to people so they can hear your perspective. Thank you. And I really appreciate you. And, and you're doing definitely some good work. Um, you're just at the start. Um, honestly, what, what classification are you? Uh, so I just finished freshman year. So I got plenty of time left. So this is good. You're, you're already taking the step and you took a huge leap. Like you literally, you're killing it already. Um, and, and just keep doing what you're doing. Make every step that you take purposeful and very intentional you have to be intentional everything every communicate whatever um conversation you have with every person it has to be god-led spirit-led you know on the on spiritual level to make sure that you're adding value and i think people will start appreciating others when they start adding value and not having a conversation just to have one like when you add value is when you start having that impact Somebody's going to be like, wow, I had that conversation with somebody and that changed my life. Or like, wow, I just talked to somebody and I made calls to prospects all day and I had that one conversation today where it made me feel good about myself. And so I think that's where it starts changing at Belmont and every university that has minorities is that they add value to each other make adding value the culture yeah like make that the coach like quote that put my name on that <laughs> make at like it should be that and when people start adding value to each other you won't have problems because you always you're doing that golden rule doing right by others like you're doing that and so i think that's that's I keep having takeaways, but <laughs> I have so much going right here. <laughs> yeah, of course. The more takeaways, the better. Yeah, man, I appreciate you. Um, definitely, um, I'm always here, um, and I would love to to have more talks on podcasts and do this again. Um, I'm I'm always I'm always an open door. I, I actually stand by my open door policy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <here> <laughs> I don't have an actual syllabus, syllabus or, or hours. Just hit me up and I'll definitely make time because I care. And because I value people, I, I make time for things that I, people I care about. So I care about you. <laughs> Christian, I care about you too. And that's all love. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too. All right. Bye. Yeah.